Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Claire Bright. I'm the director of the Nova Center on Business, Human Rights and the Environment. And I'm also the convener of the webinar series on business and uh, human rights and the environment in Europe, connecting the dots. The webinar is organized uh, by the uh, Nova Center on Business, Human Rights and the Environment. Um, in, uh, with the support of the Portuguese Presidency of the Council of the European Union and in partnership with the British Institute of International and Comparative Law, the Teaching Business uh, and Human Rights Forum and Nova for the Globe. And today uh, on Herve Day, it is my uh, absolute pleasure to welcome you all to the fourth episode of our series, which is um, dedicated to exploring the role of mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence in achieving climate targets and the goals of the Green Deal, um, which in turn is an integral part of the European Union's effort to implement the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So there are many key developments uh, at the European level that are currently happening and we'll be discussing some of those today. Um, only yesterday, the European Commission presented its proposal to reform legislation on company sustainability reporting, which seeks to strengthen the reporting obligations uh, and would require com certain companies to report on the steps that they are taking to ensure transition towards a sustainable e economy with uh, climate targets in line uh, with the Paris Agreement. Simultaneously, Still yesterday, a provisional agreement was reached on the European climate law, which enshrines the EU's commitment to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050, and also the intermediate targets of reducing net greenhouse uh, emissions by at least 55% by 2030, compared to 1990s uh, levels. This has been described as the landmark moment, uh, writing climate neutrality into binding legislation. And in order to achieve these goals, businesses have a very important role to play. In the, 19, in the 2019 report of the uh, Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and, and Human Rights, Philip Halston, um, it was uh, highlighted that fossil fuel companies are the main drivers uh, of climate change. In 2015, fossil fuel industry and its products accounted for 91% of global industrial greenhouse emissions and 70% 70, 70 of all human-made emissions. So implementing solutions to climate change must therefore necessarily um, adequately regulate business activities. And in this respect, human rights and environmental due diligence can be an important tool in achieving these goals and objectives. We know that climate change has severe impacts on the full enjoyment of human rights. Um, and in that respect, the, the report I just mentioned uh, affirmed that even under the best case scenario, hundreds of millions will face food insecurity, forced migration, disease and death. But climate mitigation too can cause human rights, adverse human rights impacts. And the just transition requires to strike a balance between the needs to decarbonize whilst upholding the rights of workers and communities. Today, we have a very impressive lineup of speakers which will, uh, who will focus on two parallel legislative developments at the European level. In particular, the horizontal mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence directive that is currently being elaborated by the European Commission um, following the announce uh, in April last year uh, by the EU Commissioner for Justice Didier Reinders of the initiative and uh, on the 10th of March um, the, the European Parliament adopted a resolution which includes uh, a draft text of uh, uh, the draft directive. Um, and we will also be discussing a parallel le legal development, which is initiative on deforestation, which also contains some due diligence requirements. So now without further ado, I will pass the floor to our chair, Joanne Scott. Joanne is a professor of EU law 
uh, and the director of the law department at the European University Institute in, in Florence. Uh, Joan, thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be there. It's a great honor and a great pleasure to have you. And uh, I will now pass you the floor to introduce our wonderful panel. Thank you, Joan. Thanks very much, Claire, for that very nice introduction and for locating the topics that we're going to be uh, talking about today. So I'm going to introduce each of our speakers and then I'm going to address a number of questions to them. So our first speaker is Dallara Burkhardt, who is a member of the European Parliament since 2019 for the German Social Democrats. Uh, as many people in the audience will know, she's the European Parliament's rapporteur for the EU legal framework to halt and reverse EU-driven global deforestation. So it's a pleasure to have uh, Dallara with us here today. Saria Deva is an associate professor at the School of Law at City University of Hong Kong and vice chair of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. He's very well known as an internationally recognized scholar in the field of business and human rights. So welcome, Saria. Ariane Griffith uh, is a senior campaigner on corporate accountability at the ever impressive Global Witness. It's fantastic to have Ariane here with us today. We were expecting to have Sebastian Lesch with us. Unfortunately, Sebastian is not able to join us due to childcare responsibilities, and he is replaced, I'm delighted to say, by his colleague Lisa Kirchel Rula, who is Deputy Head of Division 122, Sustainable Agricultural Supply Chains, International Agricultural Policy, Agriculture and Innovation with the German Federal Ministry. For economic cooperation and development. When I read that, I remind you why I'm always telling my German students your sentences are too long. <laughs> I mean, already I see the sentence being very long. <laughs> and works, uh, Lisa works on a wide range of topics, amongst them deforestation, supply chains, and sustainable cocoa. And our final speaker, Ivana Wallonia, is the Arthur Watts Research Fellow in Environmental and Climate Change Law at the British Institute of International Comparative Law and a, a licensed attorney at the Milan and Madrid Bars. He's currently doing a PhD at uh, Université de Paris 1, Pontiol Sorbonne, and he was the general rapporteur of the project Global Pact for the Environment. And it's a pleasure to have uh, Ivana with us here today. And thanks so much to Claire um, for organizing such a timely and important event and to our audience who we look forward to hearing from later on, albeit via Q&A, we will leave some time to present questions to the distinguished panelists who we're really delighted to welcome here today. So let me kick off with a, a first question to Delara. Um, I wonder, Delara, just to set the scene, if you could present some of the key elements of your report and of the various mechanisms that are envisaged within it as part of this uh, really important and impressive initiative on deforestation. Thank you for the invitation, but also I, I am very happy to give you those uh, this introduction. As you mentioned, with the Green Deal, the European Union is going for being the first climate neutral a continent, but I think what belongs with that is the question that we also take responsibilities for our external uh, footprint of um, environmental de destruction. So Europe has a responsibility when it comes to deforestation. These forests we see burning, for example, are burned because they have they are making place for spa uh, space for cattle and soy for the European market. We just saw last week that the WWF published a new study, study where it was showed that the EU is the world's second biggest importer of deforestation after China, which is responsible for 16% of global deforestation linked to trade. And in October, this is why the European Parliament has made this proposal where I was the rapporteur for a EU legal framework to stop the EU's complicity in global ecosystem destruction. And right now the European Commission is currently preparing a legislative proposal on this and we hope that they will of course take on board many of the parliament's demands. And um, I want to as quickly as po possibly fill you through the seven main points that is um, now the official position of the European Parliament and what they are built on. So the first pillar is that we want 
to see an, a framework that is based on, as you mentioned, mandatory due diligence, because we see that voluntary initiatives by companies to stop deforestation have not resulted yet in a U-turn and existing certification schemes also have their own issues. For in instance, they sometimes don't cover all relevant products. They don't cover the full supply chain or their auditing is fraudulent. And we were convinced that, or are convinced that binding measures are needed. Even the companies already active in making the supply chains more sustainable that I spoke with agree on that, that we need binding measures to have a level playing field. And this is why the European Parliament proposes that the EU adopts a regulation for mandatory due diligence that obliges companies and investors to ensure that their products and services do not contribute to the destruction or degradation of forest and important ecosystems or the violation of human rights. So what is asked from the companies? Companies shall have to map and take transparent their and make transparent their entire value chain and assess the risk of the practices on forests, ecosystems and people in all steps of the value chain and where they identify risks, they have to take action to mitigate or prevent them with the aim to have certainty that this risk is at most negligible. I believe this would be important to restore fairness in the eternal market. Companies that strive to be sustainable should no longer be put on a competitive disadvantage. We need as I said, a level playing field in the EU that is based on the protection of our natural foundations of life. The second pillar is that we need a forest, uh, a framework on the forest, a framework that is going beyond forests, also including ecosystems and human rights, because we see in the practice that, um, of course, other ecosystems than forests also have a high value for the climate and biodiversity, but, but when we prohibit turning forests into agricultural land, the pressure will shift on other valuable ecosystems as agribusinesses then will convert other ecosystems like savannas or swamps into arable land. We have seen this development, for example, in Brazil, uh, where we can observe it in the Cerrado Savanna or the Pantanal wetlands that have been increasingly also turned to agricultural land. So we say this mandatory due diligence for forest risk commodities also has to be valid for um, other valuable ecosystems. And also we made clear that we cannot speak about the destruction of forests without speaking about the violation of human rights because deforestation is often the consequence and the cause of human rights violations, for example, when it comes to land ownership rights of indigenous people. The third point in our um, resolution is that we want a framework that is going beyond legality in the producer country. I can make this point quite short because um, actually all global international initiatives that have been there to stop deforestation always had a more broader approach going beyond legality also including uh, sustainability for example the new york declaration on forests and um, so we also asked the commission to put the scope of the eu legislation um to to be broader and to apply to all deforestation and not only illegal deforestation the fourth point is that we want to go beyond consumption. We also want, and their um, global witness had a very impressive study, uh, but made it clear that we also want to go um, to, to, to include banks and other investors, because we, we know from the global witness study that between 2013 and 2019, European investors finance activities worth 7 billion, I think this is a crazy number, 7 billion euros um, for six agribusinesses alone. Um, which contributed to, to destruction of forests, so also including finance in the regulation. Um, the fifth main point is that we um, want to link due diligence to liability because we think um, without liability, the whole concept would be a toothless tiger and um, only a formulation of intent. And we, uh, we need to see also a liability um, where um, the um, due diligence um, is is you know not uh, fulfilled so this is um, also often what is uh, contested a lot uh, and it was also very contested in the parliament where we where we hear that some businesses um, or some industry um, is saying that um, that companies are held liable for what they cannot have 
influence on, which is actually not the case how we wanted it is um, as the European Parliament, we said in this question of liability that companies should merely comply with their own duties of care. And you can imagine how, how difficult this debate isn't still going to be, I think, with when it comes to, to the implementation. But as I said, I believe that a legal framework without liability would be toothless. The sixth point is that we um, that we want to take lessons learned from the EU timber regular implementation because it's uh, the most similar uh, as close as it gets to to what we propose, where we can learn a lot about um, enforcement and what went wrong. And we make um, as parliament some concrete proposals, how we can um, take lessons learned, but there will also be a fit so called fitness check by the Commission um, on the EU TR also giving more information and there we wanted to um, for example have a wide minimum standards for the quality at frequency of controls by national authorities so this would be the sixth point and the last point is that we um, of course are very aware that with the implementation of mandatory due diligence for forest risk commodities we need to have close cooperation with producing countries and this is why we um, propose a new generation of voluntary partnership agreements where we also work together with um, development uh, with the countries uh, of the producing countries, um, which is also saying, I think, a very important part. And I was too long already. So uh, I hope um, this was an overview for everyone who, ha who hasn't heard about the report, but I think a lot of you who are interested in the topic already have dealt with it. Thank you so much, Delara. You, you didn't take too long at all, and it was extremely clear and extremely helpful, in fact. And I think it, it leads directly to, to the second question. Claire already referred to the fact that there are two parallel initiatives in progress at the moment, which I think is sometimes confusing for people looking at a generic corporate due diligence proposal, and then a more specific uh, due diligence in relation to uh, forests and ecosystems. And it's the latter that you're involved in. I wonder if you can say something about the relationship between these two proposals. Are they complementary? Is there a danger that one might undermine the other? Just to give a sense of the relationship. Yeah, so actually we've been exchanging very much in the parliament um, while drafting those two reports we were having. We have something, it's called the Responsible Business Conduct Working Group for, where MEPs from all, um, from all committees come together um, and who want to have more sustainable supply chains. Not everyone wants to have that. So um, we were very close and what, what, uh, why we were drafting the report and important for us is, is that they are not, um, that they are complementary to, to, to each other and they don't overfeel. So they have some very different approaches because um, we know that the, the broader legislation proposed my, by my colleague uh, Lara Voltas is, is um, seeing due diligence as um, uh, the constitution of due diligence responsibilities as a continuous process of improvements within supply chains. Um, but I believe that the due diligence framework for the forest risk commodities, on the other hand, should go, go further than that and also entail the clear, clear possibility of market restrictions if sustainability criteria are not met, met as we have it, uh, as we should have it in, in other questions. Um, as this is a, a special high risk sector with huge impacts on the world's climate, biodiversity and people's livelihoods. So um, it's, um, of course, um, similar in the, in the thought uh, where it's going to make supply chains transparent to make them um, yeah, that you can also have a traceability um, and mitigation of them. But um, the, the core question is that the due diligence approach in the Lara Voltas report is going for a continuous process of improvement and we um, connect due diligence to the market access. So the goal would be to have no product on the EU market that is coming from deforestation. So um, yeah, that's, that's basically the main differences, but they are not working against each other. They should um, complement each other. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. And I mean, I took away also from the discussion just now, the fact that human rights is a theme in both proposals and should remain present in both proposals. It would be inappropriate um, if human rights were to be confined to the more generic proposal and to lose its place in the deforestation proposal. 
So I think that may be a very clear message that we need to take away. Yes, this is very crucial. And right now, actually not in the in the program of the Commission when it comes to de deforestation due diligence, this is what we see very critical in the Parliament. Absolutely. Great. That's that's fantastic. So we'll come back to some of those things, Delara, as we move on. But in the meantime, let me let me move to a, a more specific question, which I'll, I'll, I'll pose to Surya. So Surya, let's turn to climate change, which is obviously related to what Delara has been talking about also. Why do you think that corporate due diligence is so important when it comes to, to climate change? Uh, thanks, Professor Scott. I think that this question is more for me than for Surya. Uh, thanks also to Claire for the invitation and also for organizing such a timely webinar series. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, why do we need another legal instrument to be added to an already rich toolbox in the environmental field in order to tackle climate change? So, uh, my answer uh, is a threefold. So, it's based on the scientific, geopolitical, and legal consideration. So, the first consideration is quite known and uh, is uh, generally based on the urgency uh, of the issue of climate change and also the necessity of enriching a rich, as I was saying, toolbox that in the last 30 years since uh, 1992, so the year of the creation of the Framework Convention Climate Change, has been developed but has not been adequate to address the always worsening challenge of climate change. So from a scientific point of view, in fact, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, as you know, have risen 60% since 1992. And if the use of fossil fuels constituted at that time 80% of the global energy system, in 2020, the use of fossil fuels still constituted 80% of the global energy system. Moreover, uh, as you may know, we are already at 1.5 degrees of increased warming over pre-industrial times. And the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in its last reports, including the special one issued in 2018, uh, warned on the consequences of aiming to a two degrees Celsius increase in global temperature compared to keeping this increase below 1.5. So uh, comparing the effect of two degrees increase with a 1.5 increase, which is the main goal of this special report of 2018, the authors uh, concluded among many other consequences that a two degrees, uh, two degrees uh, Celsius increase would wipe off, wipe, wipe out, we can say 99% of the world coral reefs, rather than 70 to 90% of that. It's already catastrophic, but will be quite worse. And also it would double the number of plant and vertebrate spe species that would lose their habitats. So uh, for those looking for a silver lining, during the dramatic global experience that we all lived of COVID-19 crisis. The UN Environment Programme in last year, uh, in last year uh, uh, published the emission gap report like, like every year, highlighting that the current pandemics I'm inciting uh, offers only a short term reduction and will not contribute significantly to emission reduction by 2030, unless countries pursue an economic recovery that incorporates strong decarbonization. So in a way, this shows us the non-efficient or insufficient, I would say, instrument uh, currently used to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, especially from corporation. So I go to my second point, which is the geopolitical point of view. So the good news comes from the Green Deal, as we were saying before uh, with the Lara and the objective of net zero emission of greenhouse gases by 2050 that was reminded by Claire. Uh, the goal for Europe to become the, the world's first climate neutral continent is really comforting, I, I have to say, as well as the ambition to position EU as a global leader in the fight against climate change. Uh, in this route, to boost the efficient use of resources by moving to a clean and a circular economy uh, yesterday, uh, we had a good news, as Claire was saying, uh, the deal on the EU, EU climate law with the new emission reduction targets of, I think, if I'm not wrong, uh, 57% by 2030. 
So just in time, we can say, for attending uh, the US Climate Summit, with, which is held today and uh, tomorrow, uh, with a concrete objective, with the hope of pressuring uh, the US into increasing its own ambitions. Its own ambitions, sorry. Uh, so as, all, uh, as we all know, uh, the cooperation is really critical in this kind of global fight against climate change. And so it is the need for new legal instrument capable of pushing other states and their companies, uh, such as an increased due diligence obligations, for example, as we highlighted, as it was highlighted uh, by the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment uh, one year and a half ago in its 2019 report, which, which was represented to the UN General Assembly. And uh, that was also discussed by Professor Boyd during our webinar series at Beacle on Human Rights Due Diligence for Climate Change Impacts. We organized that in September this year at Beacle with my colleague Liz Smith. So my last point from a legal point of view, the need for corporate due diligence in relation to climate change is generally to engage directly and more effectively the main actors behind, uh, behind the externalities and uh, the climate change uh, con uh, causes and consequences. So we are talking about businesses. This kind of part, as was already discussed during the previous episodes of this webinar series, has been already taken in France and followed with proposal tabled in other countries, uh, such as the Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, and Norway, and others. However, I have to conclude saying there is also some appeal for the companies in uh, this mandatory due diligence law. Uh, on one hand, as a mean to promote harmonization and to level the playing field, which is really important in the EU, and uh, at least uh, across the EU, and then we'll see uh, uh, beyond. And on the other hand, in the sense of an improved uh, legal certainty as to the standards that corporates will, held, uh, will be held to, and in common uh, and more harmonious uh, path towards sustainability. So I stop here for the moment, and I thank you for your question again. Thank you, Ivano, for recognizing that I should have posed the question to you. And I'll, I'll simply ask um, Ariane if she would like to add anything to the answer that uh, Ivano has given us. Thanks a lot, Joanne. Yes, absolutely. I mean, Ivano's first point was on the urgency of the changes that we need to see. Um, and, and, and the fact that the science says that we're, we're, we're out of time, really. I mean, in a sentence, we need mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence for companies that covers climate change because we're already in a crisis. Um, business, is a, business is an important stakeholder here in the sense that if we are to do anything about this meaningfully, we need them on side. Um, and the response that we need to see from businesses now, from companies, requires a massive shift in the way that they do business. As we've already seen with human rights issues, this is non-negotiable. This shift is non-negotiable. We can't simply go on with business as usual and expect the outcomes to change. And human rights and environmental due diligence is a model in the sense that it's a model for, for making change since it requires companies to take action in response to an assessed set of risks and impacts. But mandatory human rights uh, and environmental due diligence or mandatory due diligence um, if, if you're following the, the OECD guidelines, is also an appropriate response because one of its central objectives is the prevention of harm. And it's about designing a system of active risk management that prevents these things from happening and mitigates the impact that it has. And in, in that sense, um, that's what we urgently need in relation to corporate action on climate change. For starters, we need businesses to to assess their, their risks and impacts on climate. Um, and there we, you know, I have at least two areas. The first of which is, um, is on emissions, on greenhouse gas emissions. And the second is on the human impacts and the human rights impacts of climate change. On emissions, for example, we need, we need companies to, to assess um, their, their own emissions um, and to measure those, as well as their, their indirect emissions. So both di their direct and indirect emissions. And then we need them to take action based on this. So we need 
we need them to stop the production of and the reliance on carbon intensive sources of energy and carbon intensive products. And we need them to do something about the carbon intensive products, the forest risk commodities, the products from deforestation that are in their supply chains and in their value chains. And then we need them to, to go through these steps of monitoring the effectiveness of the action that they're taking, publicly accounting for it and working to continuously improve it. And in that sense, human rights and environmental due diligence provides a useful framework for us in relation to and in responding to, to climate change um, and climate impacts. Um, and I think that this whole idea of continuous improvement, we can align quite well with the objectives of the Paris Agreement. Because the point is that here, we need companies to do more than produce voluntary zero deforestation policies and climate related sustainability uh, policies without doing more. And the mandatory due diligence requirement can help to make sure that companies are walking the talk on climate change. Alongside that, of course, we need mechanisms for remedy um, for those, for, for people and communities that suffer harm and we need accountability for companies when, when they get it wrong. But I think we'll get to those later. Um, so, I mean, my final thought there then is in line with this central objective of due diligence being to prevent negative impacts. The action to address climate risks and impacts needs to focus much more on reducing our absolute emissions in the short term, instead of relying on offsetting our emissions at some time in the future. And that's, uh, there's a lot of talk on that um, today in terms of Earth Day, but I think that that kind of emphasis on, on prevention, emphasis on, um, on stopping this, this cycle, needs to, to really be front and center in terms of what we require of companies and their response. I'll pause there, thanks, Joanne. That's great, thank you, Ariane. And I'm gonna come back to you in just a moment and pick up again on some of those themes. But first of all, I will turn to Saria this time and ask him um, just to help us understand um, whether climate change due diligence is the same as human rights due diligence how we should understand the relationship in general. And then I'll ask Ariane to talk a little bit about the relationship in relation to the legislative proposals that we're focusing on today. Thanks, Joanne, and thanks also to Claire for uh, the invitation. I, I mean, as a starting point, uh, I think it is fairly well established now that uh, climate change has an impact on virtually all human rights, civil, political, social, economic, and cultural human rights. So if we start with this premise, then uh, basically uh, businesses, if they do not integrate climate change considerations into the human rights due diligence, that due diligence is not going to be meaningful because they will not be able to prevent uh, adverse impact on climate. And I think that is going to impact on human rights. I think that is a starting point. But what I would like to highlight is that perhaps we also should try to appreciate that how climate change due diligence could be different in relation to the human rights due diligence. And I would like to propose uh, four points for consideration. The first point is conceptual. Human rights, most of the human rights, especially uh, traditionally are individual human rights. Of course, in the more recent times, we are looking at human rights in the collective sense as well. But predominantly human rights are individual rights. But when we talk about climate change, this is a global collective issue uh, impacting the whole society, all of us together and nature as such. So I think that is one issue that we need to consider as a point of difference. The second is that when we talk about due diligence, businesses have to locate who are going to be impacted. So who are these people? Who are the rights holders that are going to be impacted? When it comes to due diligence for human rights, it should be not that difficult for businesses if they want to really do it, to identify who will be impacted by their business activities, including the supply chains. But when it comes to climate change, I think who is not impacted? So if, if we have, let us say, if, if we have one company uh, operating, let us say in country X, 
Now that activity could potentially impact almost rest of us anywhere in the world, directly or indirectly to some extent, right? So how is this company going to consult these potential affected stakeholders? I think I'm highlighting these differences because everyone is just blindly talking about, oh, let us say human rights to religion, and that will apply for climate change, and that is going to fix everything. My point is that we need to carefully understand these differences and then design a due diligence regime which can, be, uh, which can take care of these nuances. And, and what about future generations? When we talk about human rights, we often are looking at the rights holders which are there now. But climate change is an issue which is going to be relevant even for future generations. So how companies are going to consult the generation, the people who are not even born yet. My third point is that when it comes to human rights adverse impacts, identification is easier comparatively. You can see tangible, the, the, the child labor. You can see pollution of the river. So you can see with you, your naked eyes in many situations, this is the impact, it's tangible and you can identify it. When it comes to climate change, I think in many cases, it could be very subtle and you need scientific evidence. How these companies are going to use that scientific evidence to ascertain, do they have the resources? Do they have the capacity? Do they have the will? So I think those are again, the differences we should be aware of. The fourth and the last point that I'd like to make for now is that how do we attribute the contribution? When we talk about human rights religions, now the typology of the UN guiding principles and the principle 13 is that a business may cause, contribute to, or may be directly linked to an adverse impact, right? Of course, we can apply this typology to the climate change as well. But how do we know that what is the contribution of this one particular business, to the climate change globally? how much it has to be accountable for that. So this issue of uh, linkage with what it has caused and what it needs to do to prevent that causation or contribution is going to be different in my view than the typical human rights due diligence. But there are other differences as well, Jane, but I wanted to highlight this, that we should not just uh, uh, put everything in this one basket or oh, due diligence, due diligence without understanding that human rights due diligence is a different animal than the climate change due diligence in my view. And unless we appreciate those nuances, we may not be able to design a regime which is good enough. Thank you. Thank you, Surya. That's, um, that's a very, very clear and helpful unpacking of the, the similarities and differences between climate change and human rights due diligence. And, Turning back to Ariane um, to think about the relationship, not just between climate and human rights, but environmental due diligence more generally and human rights due diligence, but more specifically bringing us back to the legislative proposals that we discussed at the beginning of the meeting. I wonder if you could say something about, about that for us, Ariane. Yes, of course. Thanks, Joanne. Um, and I mean, Surya has, has sort of touched on on the connections uh, quite concretely already. Um, it's important that the human rights impacts and the environmental impacts, which include climate change and climate impact, are both covered um, in the legislation and in this in these legislative proposals, both as individual issues and as intersecting issues. And Delara also touched on this in her introduction of, of the deforestation uh, legislative initiative. Um, and there's certainly no doubt about it uh, that, that climate change has, has serious impacts for human rights and that climate change will affect uh, the enjoyment of a range of rights and, and definitely also create setbacks in the progress that we've made uh, to enjoy the enjoyment of human rights. The, the same goes for harm to the environment more broadly. So things like pollution, um, loss of biodiversity, deforestation, and so forth, these certainly have um, very clear and, and very bad uh, impacts on, on human rights and the enjoyment of rights. With the environment, I think that it's important that we recognize that, that the environment needs protection in and of itself. 
so that we need to be considering um, we need to be considering not just when there's a harm to to human health or to or property and not just because there's harm to human health or property that we need to protect the environment we need to stop flattening forests uh, and and we need to stop for you know this this loss of biodiversity that goes with that and that happens otherwise I mean to stop climate change but we we realize that we re realize we realize as well that climate change is the impact, right? We have to look at the climate impact of climate change, not just the human rights impact of climate change. And in terms of legislating on this, um, you know, Surya just pointed to a number of the of the issues in terms of the difference between between human rights due diligence and and anything that we could consider as climate due diligence. But in terms of legislating on this, I think that one of the other issues that comes up is that thanks to the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights and the work that's been done around those over the last decade, we have, uh, we have some clarity around the fact that an adverse human rights impact is when anything reduces or, or, or removes a person's ability to enjoy any of their rights. But one of the things that the Commission and, and the EU's legislative bodies more broadly will have to decide is what constitutes an adverse environmental impact. Um, and Global Witness published a, a policy briefing yesterday which sets out our position and, and proposals on a number of, of these issues. But in relation to, to adverse environmental impacts in particular, what we're proposing is that there's a non-existent list of impacts that's included in the legislation. It has to be broad and it should be developed in consultation with stakeholders. And we need this in order to, in order for it to be effective. We need this to include actual and potential impacts. We need it to include um, impacts that have different, different magnitudes and frequencies, especially if we're talking about environmental issues. And then we need to also take into account the fact that we have permanent, uh, we have temporary and permanent um, impacts that that happen here and there's precedent for for that sort of approach in domestic legislation in Australia for example and you know I instantly sort of hear that, that then we have issues with enforcement and so on and enforcement is is quite another matter and, and Delara touched on this in her introduction the point is that we need to have strong regulation in place and we need in addition to that to have strong enforcement and one without the other either one without the other won't work well um, so the point is here that coming back to the legislation, the directive should account for the individual elements of human rights issues and environmental issues, and it needs to also account for the extent to which they overlap. And that overlap is, is, is definitely uh, quite well known, particularly in these circles, um, in terms of people who are likely to be, to be attending this webinar um, and watching it afterwards. But the commission in its in its proposal, what we what we hope to see is this accounting for these individual elements and accounting for the overlap between them to demonstrate an understanding of the complexity of the impacts that companies have through their operations and through their value chains. And the second point um, that I wanted to touch on uh, is which is the other place that this question becomes very important is on remedy and accountability companies need to be held accountable for their environmental impacts, uh, as with their human rights impacts, um, and with their climate related impacts, just, just for emphasis, um, even if these are not, in the case of environmental and climate impacts, even if these are not overtly or explicitly tied to human rights violations. On access to remedy, which I know that, um, that we'll, we'll get into in some more detail later, environmental claims in the legislation can't be prevented, um, or rather, environmental claims can't prevent victims of human rights abuses from having recourse for those impacts, or vice versa. So that's another thing that I think is really important that we need to see in the legislation and the approach to this interplay between human rights and, and environmental issues. Administrative liability can't preclude, you know, civil claims from victims against a company in relation to, um, for example, in relation to, to the same set of environmental harms that, that a, 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 um, let's say, a, a national authority, a national competent authority finds, um, 
that there's administrative liability for the company in relation to a particular environmental harm, the legislation really needs to take into account the fact that that can't preclude um, civil liability and vice versa for human rights harms, for example. And, um, and I think that just in closing, I think that we need to, we need to anticipate these intersections and respond to them by, by really creating multiple avenues for responsibility and for accountability and multiple avenues that are not mutually exclusive, that allow for recourse against the company when there are either or both of these harms happening. Great, thank you so much. And um, you know, that hopefully takes us back to the point that was made at the beginning about how important it is for us to learn from the lessons of the timber regime where enforcement has been one of the weaknesses, both in terms of differences between member states, but also differences between the different issue areas. So that's really helpful. And I think the next question follows up very directly on, on Ariane's comments. And this is addressed to Surya. I wonder, Surya, if you could tell us something more about how you see the importance of legal remedies in the, in the context of climate change specifically. Sure, thanks. thanks. Uh, so I think there are two elements why remedies are vital. Uh, I mean, the first point is that uh, rights and remedies go hand in hand. If we do not have effective remedies, we can't really say that these are the rights. So if we are talking about human rights, they have to be remedies and businesses, if they breach human rights, they have to be held accountable. And I think that's where I completely agree with Dilara's point that this uh, due diligence or mandatory due diligence, if it does not include effective remediation element, if it does not include the possibility of effective accountability, then I think this is going to backfire, in fact. This is going to be counterproductive, in fact, uh, for, the, for the communities on the ground. That's the first point. The second point is that however best we or companies try, prevention is never foolproof. Some violations of human rights or some adverse impact on climate is inevitable. And if it is inevitable, then we need to find who has to be accountable for that whether this is the government, whether this is a company or both of them. So the responsibility or accountability and remediation is absolutely vital. Now in relation to climate change, in my view, preventive remedies would be absolutely vital. So how can we prevent, so uh, of, often we talk about prevention, but we don't talk about preventive remedies. So I would like to highlight that sometimes remedies could be preventive in the sense they could be an injunction, for instance. So before a company starts a project, let us say a coal power plant, and if the plant has already started, then it is too late. So can we prevent that coal power plant from starting in the first place? So that is a preventive remedy. And I think those kind of remedies would be absolutely vital uh, in relation to climate change in my view. But we also need to think that how do we seek these remedies? Let us say we have a company in Europe. It is possible that thousands of people could potentially file a case against this company. That this French company, let us take a French company as an example, has caused climate change in Fiji. It has caused climate change in Mauritius and in Maldives, right? So how are these victims going to access the forum? How many cases are, are going to be litigated against this one company, right? So I think these are complex questions again, which differentiate climate change from human rights uh, adverse impacts in my view. And I think that is where the element of collective remediation may be relevant. We might need to create a global fund, for instance, right? Uh, that could uh, take care of uh, the adverse impact on climate anywhere globally. And then the, it could be just about distribution and prevention of those particular elements. So I think uh, we, we need to be really careful in understanding that we need remedies, of course, but we need perhaps some remediation of a different kind in relation to climate change in terms of the standing, who can file a case for remedy, 
in terms of what remedies uh, the court or non-judicial forum can award. For instance, the Philippines uh, National Human Rights Commission has done the carbon measure inquiry, right? So what recommendations uh, or, or, or that report, what, what implications that would have for remedies, right? So those are the issues that we need to carefully consider. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And um, I think uh, it's helpful to move on to Ivano here to think um, in terms of distinctive remedies coming out of the due diligence uh, legislation or potential legislation, but also to think a little bit creatively about what role do you think due diligence could play more generally in relation to the kind of climate litigation that we're starting to see emerging within the European Union? That's a very interesting question for me because uh, in the last year and a half I'm uh, working a lot on, uh, on the field on, uh, of uh, climate change litigation. So. Uh, in order to answer properly to this, I would like to spend just a couple of minutes on a sort of short introduction climate litigation before responding about the possible uses of a corporate due diligence duty in the environment in the European context. So first of all, uh, as you may know, uh, climate change litigation is a phenomenon who has spread rapidly and far beyond the borders of Europe in the last decades. Uh, starting from, uh, we can say, really a handful of cases in the 1990s. As of today, there are more than 1,600 cases uh, identified globally in uh, the uh, very, very useful climate change litigation database. But databases, because there are two, there are known in US and US database, uh, covered by the Sabin Center for Climate Change at Columbia University. So this is a very interesting tool for all the people that are studying climate change litigation, covering 37 countries and until now eight regional international jurisdiction. We must, however, mention that more than three quarters of the total of the cases are identified in the United States alone. When we talk about climate change litigation, we are talking about a very heterogeneous category of legal action. Uh, legal action, so including both court cases and administrative proceedings, and as was uh, mentioning by was mentioned by Surya, Surya also petitions and prosecutions addressing both issues of migration, uh, of mitigation. Sorry, also migrations as well as adaptation. But these are the two main uh, points. Among all these cases, uh, cases considered to have flooded the, the courts, especially domestic courts. We are talking about this. Several types of climate change litigation have been distinguished, and I think that could be helpful for understanding where we are going. So on one hand, we have what we call the strategic cases, which are those cases uh, in climate litigation with a, a visionary approach, uh, aiming to influence public and private climate accountability. So this is also the kind of case we say, OK, we haven't uh, won, but anyway, uh, it was uh, important because uh, it pushed a little bit the public opinion. On the other hand, we have uh, what we call the routine cases, uh, less visible cases uh, uh, dealing with, for example, planning application allocation of emission allowances under, for example, uh, schemes like uh, the European Emission Trading System. And we have also another distinction that I think is quite important. Uh, which is made in the literature between proactive litigation and reactive litigation. So the one is the one, the, the, the kind of cases that are initiated in order to engender policy change. Uh, for example, uh, requesting to the adoption or the reform of a leg legislation. And the other one is a reactive litigation. So which are initiated to resist such a change. Uh, for example, by challenging the adoption of new or reformed legislation. I don't go into the detail, but it's interesting to see, for example, in the US, where we have so many cases, uh, which kind of litigation we have, uh, considering which period, uh, in which period we have, uh, we are, uh, and which president we have. So uh, under Trump or under Obama or under uh, now uh, or under now uh, the, the new president, uh, Joe Biden. So why is the majority of climate litigation cases? Um, uh, that is really to finish this uh, short introduction, which are approximately uh, three quarters of the total have been filed against states. Climate change related cases also been filed against private actors, mostly carbon majors, what we were talking about. So 
fossil fuel and cement company, which are, we, we know that are major greenhouse gas emitters. So unfortunately, bad news, this kind of cases against the private actor has, have not been really successful as, uh, so far. However, I think that we can start seeing uh, interesting developments, uh, notably related to corporate due diligence in relation to climate change in the European context, just to go uh, at the core of, of the question. So an interesting example, for example, uh, come from France, uh, where there, have been, uh, there has been already the first legal proceedings based on the French the duty of vigilance law, which have been brought against the whole uh, company total. So in particular, in this case, uh, uh, the, there were 14 local authorities and five associations, uh, among which there, was, uh, there is also the famous Notre Ferratus, uh, the La Ferre du Siècle, which is another case, uh, and Sherpa. And this uh, uh, association, the uh, local authorities, brought Total to court because of its major contribution to climate change and the inadequacy of the measure taken by the company uh, to prevent the resulting human rights health and safety, and environmental damage. So uh, the claimants rely on, as I was saying, the duty of vigilance law, but also on the judge's power to order measures to stop or prevent environmental damages under the new article 1252, which is new because we had the, since 2016 with the Loi sur la biodiversité, the biodiversity law. Uh, so this is uh, an article of the French Civil Code, a new one, and the claimants seek, uh, this is interesting, an order uh, requiring Total in the first place to devise a corporate strategy for addressing the risk of climate change, rather than asking the court to devise such a strategy. So this is a way going in the direction of what is uh, uh, said by the law. And the case, um, as you may know, is ongoing. But uh, in February, last February, uh, an order was issued uh, by the Tribunal de, uh, of Nanterre. So the judge was questioned on the jurisdiction competent for the case, and the judge confirmed that the jurisdiction was uh, the civil court. So going back to also the question of which kind of remedy can we, we, we can use. And uh, we will see about this. Another interesting case is, uh, that I want to, uh, to mention is uh, uh, which goes always in the sense of climate due diligence, is the one of Enea Ostroleka. This case has been one of the most high profile cases in the EU, and it relates to the idea of the campaign Beyond Coal. So this uh, particular power plant in Enea Ostroleka was meant to be the last uh, coal-fired power plant to be built in Poland for the cost of 1.2 billion. Uh, there was a shareholder resolution consenting to the construction of these coal-fired power plants, uh, however, an environmental law firm filed a shareholder suit, lawsuit that sought to uh, annul uh, the resolution and to hold that the resolution was invalid. One of the core argument behind the Clements case was the power plant harmed the company's economic interest due to climate related financial risk. So that's, that is really interesting. And in other words, this power plant would be a stranded asset. And it was not in the country or even the company's interest to build this power plant. So the case was brought uh, in the Polish Commercial Companies Court. And in uh, August last year, the regional court in Poland, no, uh, in 2019, uh, the regional court in Poland found uh, the resolution to be invalid. So this was one of the obstacles in the construction of this uh, coal fired power plant. And since then, uh, there have been other factors that have stood in the way mostly to do with decision by investors they will not be uh, investing in this coal fire plant because of the direction being taken by the EU Green Deal also. So this is going back to our main center of uh, our discussion. So uh, while main co many companies uh, currently interpret the duty of, village, of vigilance uh, rest restrictively, we can say, as a compliance exercise limited to the implementation of internal risk management processes. Uh, the forthcoming decisions in the various litigation underway will be dec decisive as the actual content of these requirements, uh, which are now inspiring, as we were saying, the European legislator. So, however, uh, just uh, 
uh, before concluding, we should mention that there is also an argument that, in fact, uh, mandatory due diligence will increase the climate litigation, not only for uh, the company who do not comply, which is uh, probably justifiable, uh, but also against those companies who, uh, by complying and uh, providing details of their climate change impacts and the step they are taking to address those, uh, they may therefore be targeted by claimants both for the impacts they have uh, identified or by it being said that they are not doing enough. So this is also interesting because in a way it will enlarge. Uh, I think that would be really an intended consequences of any due diligence law, but this perhaps an, um, uh, in, an inevitable one. Uh, to conclude, uh, an import another important point is the extent, so the other side, is the extent to which corporate due diligence can be used also as a mean of defense. So I think that most corporate practitioners would advocate uh, that this should be the case, especially as I was saying before, considering the currently uh, there is a significant, uh, significant uncertainty about what the climate related standard of care amounts to, and also what companies need to be doing to discharge uh, their duties and to reduce the litigation risk. So that is without, of course, considering uh, the harmonization point that I made in the last question, uh, which is related to the risk of member states exploring different avenues on this and the company being left facing a real jungle of different standards to comply with uh, in the European level. So an European harmonized and mandatory corporate due diligence uh, uh, would be then considered as a safe harbor to climate related claims and where a company can demonstrate that it has undertaken adequate and appropriate measures to comply with this due diligence that can be a defense to a claim, a claim of breach so the forthcoming european legislation may really can help in this sense providing of course more clarity on such standards of care for cooperation notably in relation to climate change, because this is the point, which is important to highlight. Uh, it is already existent uh, through a, a soft law normative framework uh, at the international level or through uh, fragmentary regulatory developments in the different European legislations. So this new European legislation will provide better regular, regulatory guidance to business on one side and uh, to facilitate a better access to remedies for individuals and for communities affected by climate change on the other side. Apologies for being too long, maybe. That's fine, that's fine. And in fact, it intersects a little bit with a question that's been posed by Jasper that we'll come back to at the end concerning uh, the danger that human rights due diligence could in the end provide a shield for companies. Um, so we may come back and discuss that in, in a little while. But first of all, I'd, I'd like to, to turn back to Ariane, because we've heard a lot about the role of due diligence now as a systemic instrument for preventing harms and also for creating accountability frameworks when harms do occur. I wonder, Ariane, from where you're sitting, do you also see an important role for climate litigation and the associated legal remedies? Thanks, Joanne. Certainly, I think that, um, my co-panelists have, have raised quite uh, quite a number of really interesting issues. And I mean, I think I'll just, I'll keep my, my remarks brief in the interest of time. And I, I'll focus just a little bit on, on this whole question of corporate accountability. Um, because leaving aside the questions of, of safe harbor and the possibility of a, of a due diligence defense and so on, the fact of the matter is that for affected people and communities around the world, the, the possibility of, of litigation, this mechanism, um, this mechanism through which they can approach the courts and can hold companies to account is really important. Legal liability for companies is an essential component of, 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 this, of, of, these, of both legislative proposals. And I think that there's quite some consensus um, on the panel in terms of that, that position. And part of the reason that that's important is because it creates consequences. It creates penalties for companies where there are few, if any, 
you know, right now. Um, but also coming back to this point that I, I was just making about more meaningful opportunities for victims of human rights abuses and of environmental harm to hold companies to account. I think that the, the legislation hopefully will, will help to, to correct the current, um, the current challenge, which is a monumental one, of it being far too difficult and far too expensive to hold companies to account. And that's speaking in absolute terms, right? So it's worse still if you think about it in relative terms, when you think about the imbalance of power between victims and the companies who they are trying to get, um, who, who they're seeking recourse against. And, you know, in closing, I think it's just that due diligence will, will require a change of course from companies, changing how they behave. And then what we need the legislation to do and what we need um, these sorts of uh, remediation mechanisms, um, climate change litigation and so on, what we need that to do is create a situation where if they don't do that, if they don't change course and they don't change how they behave, that that can no longer be without consequence. Um, and that if they cause harm, there are penalties. And climate change litigation, strategic litigation and test cases are, and so on are, are important mechanisms for accountability. And we recognize that that's partly symbolic. Um, and, you know, it's called a test case for a reason, but it also has an important deterrent effect. And that, that too is, uh, you know, has value and can spur action in the direction that we need more companies to be moving in because there is clarity on that. So human rights and environmental due diligence together with liability should cause companies to change course. And that should mean that if we get the enforcement right, if we get the liability mechanism right, that they can't just do what they like and continue, quite frankly, continue to get away with it. Okay, that's great. So that's a sort of very positive um, explanation of the importance of due diligence, which I think has been really helpful. Saria, in, in light of that, I want to ask you though a, a question that may be a little bit unfair because of its, its breadth. Even if we recognize the importance, as I certainly do, and Ariane has helped to convince me, the importance of the due diligence framework and specifically the legislative initiatives with, that we're experiencing in, in Europe at the moment, what else do we need? Do we need more? And if so, what else do we need to tackle the looming cri uh, climate crisis? Now, that's an impossibly broad question. So maybe give us your top two or three um, bullets. Thanks, Joanne. I think human rights due diligence is uh, an important step. Uh, but if I could be a little bit provocative here, it will not be a sufficient step to achieve the goal that we want to achieve here, whether it is about uh, respecting human rights or uh, protecting the climate in my view. So we should not see human rights to religions, including the mandatory one as a panacea, that it can fix everything. And that's why I would caution uh, people against putting all eggs in one basket and think that mandatory due diligence in Europe or globally is going to solve everything that we're talking about. We may need more than this in my view. Uh, and I, let me give three concrete examples. One is we need incentives for businesses, uh, whether to respect human rights and also to uh, ensure that they do not uh, damage the climate. So I think we need positive incentives. That is first point. At the same time, in my view, there should be red lines. Kind of this idea of due diligence sometimes creates this illusion that for businesses, everything is fine as long as they do due diligence. And I, I personally do not believe that is the right approach because let us say tobacco company. Can a tobacco company ever comply with UN guiding principles? I have my doubts. Of course, tobacco companies claim that they respect UN guiding principles, but I don't agree with this proposition. If, if merely they remove child labor from their supply chain, that is not respecting human rights because the very product is contrary to the idea of right to life and right to health. Similarly, in relation to climate change, should we allow, for instance, deep sea mining 
And I think that can be justified because uh, we need renewable energy, we need battery operated uh, vehicles, we need more minerals, and that's why deep sea mining should be allowed, right? But should there be certain red lines where the due diligence is not going to be enough in my view? And my third example is uh, that the due diligence is operating within the system, but perhaps we need fundamental structural changes to the current economic order. And I think the COVID pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic has really exposed it. We need a radical shift, how we live and our relationship with nature. And I don't think human rights religions is going to change that. For instance, do we need to go back to bikes or battery operated cars? That is the question we should be asking. Because when plastic bags were introduced many years ago, we thought, oh, very good. And now we are trying to get rid of the plastic bags. So are we creating uh, uh, another crisis by solving this crisis? I think that is the question we should be asking. Companies create unnecessary consumption in the market. How due, due diligence is going to fix it? So I have my doubts. So we need, definitely need due diligence, but I would say we need human rights due diligence plus. We need more than that. And I think we, we need to think carefully what those other elements we need. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, that, Surya. Um, a very broad question and uh, a very broad and compelling answer. So I'm going to turn now to Lisa, who's um, been left a little bit um, in, in, in the dark, literally. I, I don't see Lisa there. Are you there with us, Lisa? Hi. Hi. Yeah. Okay. We've, left, we've, we've left you. We've left you till close to the end. But I I now would like to to ask you a few questions, if I may. Um, first of all, um, can we turn to the question of um, supply side measures as opposed to demand side measures, which we've been focusing on so far, mainly with due diligence. Um, do you believe that EU due diligence proposals, maybe particularly the deforestation proposal? have the capacity to serve as a catalyst for regulatory reform in countries outside of the European Union? Um, yes, we can see that already now in discussions. We do have, for example, in the EU COCO talks, we have a very lively participation of our partner countries, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. Um, before it was always quite a question how to really get to a high level a dialogue. Now we are there, so I can already say that something is happening and um, yeah I, I'm sure that due diligence requirements by the European Union um, as one of the largest markets in in the world will send a strong political signal to the world and um, of course we see this especially in our partner countries the development countries and um, we, for example, we are looking for catalysts now. Yeah, for example, we would very much welcome if our partners in the G7, um, with whom we always work uh, very much on development issues, would um, fight as well or uh, introduce uh, due diligence obligations. And um, they, that, this would really contribute to a level playing field and we could really broaden the market. I mean, G7 is not yet G20, we're in the end and G77 where we have to, to, to end, but that, for example, would put as well more pressure on, on the whole legal discussion. And um, um, in the looking at G7, there are already in, initiatives underway um, in, in parallel to the European Union of course, you know, the UK already sets up a due diligence requirements to ensure um, that commodities are not associated with illegal deforestation. And in the US, a similar initiative uh, on illegal deforestation driven by commodity expansion is under underway. Maybe this just to complete a bit the picture of demand side measures. And um, of course, at the same time, we must carefully assess the impacts on production countries. Um, both in terms of intended and unintended effects. And, um, uh, but uh, I'm sure that, um, that the European due diligence regulation inspires the, our production partner countries to address uh, relevant risks more seriously. And uh, where, where might that happen? So the low social and environmental risks in a uh, production country will become a competitive advantage. So there's intense 
there is an incentive to uh, tighten the law, yeah, and um, and this would hopefully trigger a race to the top instead of a, the current race to the bottom, where of course the demand side countries are responsible for to look where where can I have the the most uh, cheap uh, place for production, for example, in textiles. And um, yeah, of course, we know in many countries, the problem is rather a lack of enforcement and not a lack of a regulatory framework. Um, we see that in child labor, there are already a lot of um, laws underway. And uh, um, yeah, but, and, and I expect companies um, as well, if they, especially if they engaged in multi-stakeholder fora, to ca call for and, and support a better enforcement in the future, um, in the in the country of production, in the where, where they have their partner uh, businesses or they um, uh, sub um, uh, sub uh, sub businesses. So. Um, the European Union should also employ soft powers to that end. I think future dialogue with all relevant stakeholders in production countries, not only governments, but also, for example, indigenous communities and civil society in general, will be important to foster transparency and change. And this is why we as German um, development policy, we, we always support civil society and cooperatives um, yeah, to raise the vo voice and to, to really look that as well, the, the advantages but as well, like remedies, but as well the burdens maybe of this due diligence legislation, which might occur as well, the, will be really um, fairly shared um, and, and that the most responsible businesses really then carry the burden and not in the end the smallholder farmers, for example. Um, yeah, as I already mentioned, um, uh, yes, the international co uh, cooperation uh, has a role to play and um, we as BMZ, we are engaged and we expect the European Union to assess um, how the European Union can support partner countries um, to reduce social and environmental risks. Um, we are in very good discussion with them and um, that should be part of the impact assessment. Um, we do support sustainable supply chains through projects worldwide, world uh, projects worldwide in various sectors. Um, I just mentioned cocoa, but as well as textiles um, and mining. So uh, we have this whole uh, um, quite a, a horizontal approach to that. Um, yeah, so we address both both sides, ends of the supply chain, and we are as well engaged in on the demand side, uh, uh, and uh, especially now with our upcoming German due diligence act, and um, the supply side uh, with numerous projects, um, as I just uh, laid out. Yeah, thank you. Maybe. Open Thank to you. more questions. <laughs> Certainly, you will. We have more questions for you. That's that's very helpful. And I think the discussion of supply side measures takes us back to a point that Delara made right at the beginning, actually, which is the relationship between the due diligence proposal and the future uh, voluntary partnership agreements. And if we have time at the end, I'm keen to ask Delara to say something more about how she sees that relationship evolving uh, in the Commission at the moment. But first, let's just ask a couple more questions to, to Lisa, a little bit overlapping with what I asked Surya a few moments ago, which is if we think about um, you know, the idea of a smart mix of measures, which is talked about so much in regulation theory these days, could you say something about what you think uh, the elements could be or should be that we need to support a due diligence obligation, to complement and support a due diligence obligation? Yes, of course, um, as we already talk about a smart mix of mandatory and non-mandatory measures, but of course there are as well several mandatory measures. So um, in, uh, we have to ensure policy coherence there. And um, for example, uh, a strong tool besides due diligence obligations um, are trade measures and they should definitely be aligned. Um, I, there is still a need, I have the feeling, for example, in the deforestation debate that, um, yeah, uh, 
like what we're going to, to do with Mercosur and what will be happen in the due diligence or in the deforestation regulation uh, directive, um, um, how, how all this can, can come together. Um, as uh, not only uh, new free trade agreements, but as well the WTO has to be reformed in, in general and um, to better contribute to sustainable development. Um, the GATT um, adopted uh, more than um, 60 years ago and the world of today is very different. And we, yeah, we see really an, a strong need for reforms, but this is a very slow and, and, and big, uh, yeah, um, a, a slow development and a very big task, but uh, we are very hopeful with the new WTO director that there will that there's a real chance. Um, yeah. Then there are other elements. Um, um, it's important to create a common language and industry-wide parameter to implement the Green Deal as a whole. Uh, for example, with the EU taxonomy, the European Un Union will create a common classification system for sustainable economic activities to pave the way for a more sustainable finance sector. Um, De Lara was already mentioning as well finance, very important. And um, of course, this must be based on scientific evidence. Um, therefore, the recommendations of the platform on sustainable finance must be the basis for the upcoming uh, delegate acts. Um, then um, in December 2020, the EU Council adopted conclusions on decent work and human rights that call for an EU action plan on shaping global supply chains sustainably. And in line with the Green Deal, this action plan could sh and should address all three dimensions of sustainability, also the environment, as we talk uh, here um, on, 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 on climate change. And um, uh, furthermore, um, so it's a lot, of course we can look at a lot of instruments, but let me still uh, mention uh, one thing I touched already up Upon are the multi-stakeholder platforms uh, and sustainability standards, which uh, stay uh, stand a bit for the voluntary world we were in until now, but they still play a very important role to be um, uh, at the upfront of the development and and at the same time to create acceptance in the business world and. Uh, so we are very engaged in the European Union's um, Sustainable Cocoa Initiative and bring in our um, multi-stakeholder platforms. Um, and we are very aligned with the other um, cocoa platforms in of uh, the Netherlands, of Switzerland and Belgium. Uh, they're called ISCO, so the cocoa initiatives, but other platforms on textiles, banana, orange juice, um, coffee, coffee, of course, one of the first ones, uh, a very, uh, and palm oil, an uh, uh, important driver for sector wide change. Um, yeah. And um, last but not least, the, the mentioned development corporation supporting uh, uh, projects on the ground for, on, for uh, civil society, child labor remediation systems, all the tools we finance, uh, on, on foreign red plus uh, uh, income to people who live in, in, in the forests, all the, the, the whole rainbow of projects are important. Um, then there is, there's always a discussed as well topic on public procurement. Um, this is in a way a difficult one or a, a little bit slow one, but still it's always good as well um, to, to show as well our decision makers um, on the community level of, of in the level of the cities that everybody can do something. Yeah, so maybe this is uh, some an overview of the smart mix as, uh, mix as we see it. Great, so I'm going to ask you one more question and I'm sure it's a question that everybody on the panel would have something to say about, but um, it's a question that we very often are asked when we're hearing about European Union initiatives, which is, okay, we know the European Union is an important um, destructive importer of forest and ecosystem risk commodities. And uh, Delara referred to a World Wildlife Report uh, uh, earlier on, which gives us yet more evidence. So that said, the European Union is an importer of a small fraction of such commodities. So can the European Union really acting alone ever do more than simply displace or shift the problem elsewhere in the globe? Yeah, uh, of course, um, this is the big 
art, we, we are uh, a very, a very big task now. Of course, we have to start. If we do not start, um, we should not wait for, for everybody else to start. But of course, we have to think how to design our European measures um, in a way that at least aims to create impact beyond our, our European supply chains. And as the WWTF report last week shows, um, Europe is a second largest market for forest risk commodities. This is not nothing, but so there is a lever, of course, if, if we change something. However, there is um, sufficient land available deforested long ago to supply the European Union through segregated supply chains. And um, if we only clean up European supply chains without looking at the bigger picture, we risk having rather little um, impact on the ground. And, and the impact on, a, on the ground is so substan substantial. We cannot wait that, I mean, a tree which is falling down, it, it's, it fell down, it can't get up tomorrow. Maybe in human rights, uh, we can improve our life uh, the day after tomorrow, but for nature, it's so difficult to catch up again. Or maybe in our idea, uh, if, we, if we think of a big tree um, somewhere, there will grow something, but in the end, we, we will not profit from that. So, um, of course, we, we must create broader incentives to stop deforestation. And um, uh, in case um, the European Commission will suggest due diligence measures on deforestation, um, we must design these in a way that covers companies' entire operations. At this point, uh, please allow me to congratulate you, Delara, again for leading on the European Parliament's ambitious resolution on deforestation, and which is really this, it's this integrated uh, uh, view. And um, um, I could imagine that a benchmarking marking of production regions on subnational level could be linked with temporary support from the European Union and member states in case of rising deforestation rates. Um, and this is visible then for everybody, for every purchaser. Also, we could think about linking due diligence requ requirements more specifically with the assessed level of risk, um, which could ultimately result in market restrictions in case of continually high defor deforestation rates. Um, so this will be as well as well affect the region as a as a whole and um, and um, but as I just just laid out, of course we have to to give incentives, work in partnership together, look at the local entities as well who are really in, interested, um, like the uh, the region of Maranhão, to protect their forests in in Brazil and. Um, um, to this end, we should think beyond development cooperation and assess what role uh, as well, what role trade incentives could play as well. Um, it's difficult because we have zero tariffs on imported soy, for example, but maybe there are some creative people who, who think, okay, this could change, or maybe there is well other trade, uh, 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 trade measures. Um, um, we, we just had a discussion where we found out that there needs to be a, a bit more uh, uh, yeah, food for we need a bit more food for for, for the brain uh, on the on the trade issues. So I'm I'm grateful for for any further ideas on that. Um, and last uh, last uh, not least, of course, the the dialogue um, with the other consumer countries, China. We we hope very much with the UK fact dialogue that we get a feeling at least how far we can get. We we try to negotiate. Uh, common uh, um, statement, and there we will see how far we, we, we are able to agree upon, at least on goals. Um, and, and we always try to bring in the, the issue of deforestation at the moment. So let's see how, how we are able to create awareness uh, at the big, um, and as well uh, uh, um, towards our other partners of the big consumer countries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. We left you till close to the end, but we, we made you work hard when your when your time came. Uh, you've you've introduced the trade theme. So let me let me finish the questions um, to our panelists um, by raising that actually, um, by raising the question of what role trade and investment agreements um, can play generally in relation to the topic of conversation, but more specifically perhaps in re relation to climate change. Now this again is a huge topic and um, uh, I'm going to ask Saria and Ivano to 
say something about this, but taking just a, a short time each so we have time for some final comments and also questions from our, our audience. Yeah, uh, I would start, if I may, uh, so I'm aware of time, so just uh, to state the obvious, uh, these international trade investment agreements are treated that are the objective of promoting and protecting cross-border trade investment flows, just to know what we are talking about. So uh, what role should trade the investment agreement play? Uh, they could potentially play a key role in the efforts to boost climate-friendly uh, trade and also to direct investments to meet climate change uh, mitigation and also, of course, adaptation needs. And of course, at the same time, uh, directing investment away. This is also the other side from business as usual practices. So in a way, this kind of agreement uh, can help overcome uh, what we can call the chronic lack of ambition necessary to create uh, transformi transformative solutions. If you want to avoid, as I was saying before, the most catastrophic effects of climate change and to limit global warming before, uh, below 1.5 degrees, as I was saying before in this uh, report from 2018. So that could be done. Uh, let me resume very simplistically, if I may, but it was really general. So I just want to not waste uh, a lot of time on this uh, by removing tariffs and harmonizing the standards on environmental goods and, good and services, and uh, by eliminating distortionary and poorly designed subsidies on fossil fuels and agriculture. These are the main points. However, this, um, uh, we can call this harmonization should be conducive to what we can call uh, uh, the race to the top. Uh, uh, you were mentioning before this. So uh, to always better standards and in, in the sense of improving climate policies. So unfortunately, as you know, the history tell us uh, something very different from this. So international tariff reduction has increased uh, trade in carbon intensive and environmental destructive uh, uh, products uh, such as fossil fuels and timber more than uh, it has for environmental goods. Uh, and uh, I can add also that in the context of climate change, there is the classical divide that we find between environment and trade uh, with um, a real concern that potential ambitious climate policies will uh, fall uh, foul uh, of uh, WTO, uh, WTO uh, rules if they are perceived to uh, arbitrarily or unjustif uh, unjustifiably uh, discriminate against the third countries. We know this is uh, one of the main debates since the, uh, the 90s with the, the famous uh, this, uh, cases. Uh, so this classical divide no, now is even more evident if we consider that on one side we have that um, the always more clear and evidence-based, I was saying before, uh, limits our climate system. And on the other side, we have a trade and its centrality for economic growth. So in my opinion, uh, the original scene here is uh, related to the old fashioned paradigm of development, uh, which is considered as a synonym of economic growth since the, after the second world war, which traditionally is considered strictly, strictly interlinked with trade. Now, the problem with climate change uh, uh, can be resumed through, uh, I like this uh, image, the famous bath bathtub uh, uh, analogy. So the bathtub represents the climate system and the water level represents uh, CO2. So adding water from the tap represents addition of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere from human sources. If you keep adding water, eventually the tap, of course, will overflow and spill the water on the floor. In our cases, in our case, this represents our incapacity or incapability of limiting the most dangerous effect of climate change. Uh, simply said, trade investment agreement should avoid to provide additional load to the climate system. And in the case of the use trade investment agreements, we can just agree that they should be aligned with the forthcoming EU legislation on mandatory uh, human rights for how, uh, as is, um, is written now, uh, environmental and cl climate change, of course, due diligence, because this is a, a whole. And uh, this kind of agreement should galvanize and reinforce also the efforts required of business to conduct human rights, environmental climate change due diligence, as I was saying, under the EU legislation, and also helping moving in the sense 
of this transition, this ecological neutral, a carbon neutral transition that we always hope and that we are talking all the time about. So uh, I stop here and I leave the, the, word, uh, the floor to Surya. Thank you very much, Ivano. Surya, would you like to add a, a brief point or two on the same theme of trade and investment agreements? Thanks. Uh, yes, I will be very brief uh, because of the limited time that we have now. So I think I will make three suggestions that how investment agreements could contribute to mitigating climate change. First is that uh, most of these investment agreements uh, confer rights on investors, but they don't impose obligations on investors. So I think going forward, these investment agreements must impose human rights obligations, including the obligation to conduct human rights due diligence. So that, that, that will uh, fix the current imbalance in these investment agreements. Second, uh, these in investment agreements should preserve the regulatory space that governments would need going forward uh, to take a step to uh, mitigate climate change. In fact, there has been a recent case when a company, I will not name the company or the country, but bo both are from Europe. So one country in Europe proposed that, okay, we are going to uh, phase out uh, the coal power plants. And then another company from Europe said, oh, we're going to take you to the arbitration because if you do that, then this is going to reduce our profit. So I think we need to ensure that the states have plenty of regulatory space that they will need to take concrete actions and fast actions to manage climate change crisis. And finally, access to science and technology is going to be very crucial to manage climate change. And I think the investment agreements could facilitate uh, investment into developing green technologies and also ensuring that the global south has access to those technologies. Otherwise, uh, we will not be able to solve this crisis. Thank you very much. Thanks, Surya. So very important point about regulatory space. Important that these agreements leave regulatory space and that we don't always believe governments when they tell us they don't have the necessary regulatory space, which is an argument which is very often used in a not very convincing way. So before we turn to q and I'm going to I'm going to ask our two speakers who we haven't learned, we haven't heard from for a while, which is Delara and Ariane. I'm just going to give each of them a, a couple of minutes to, to make their points that they, they feel a burning need to make as we reach the end of this session. So start with, let's start with Delara. I would also happy to directly react to questions, but um, first I want to congratulate you to setting up this, this uh, panel because I also, um, had a lot of uh, new thoughts on that. Um, I just wanted to, to underline two points. The, the first one is um, when it comes about the responsibility and saying that uh, if Europe acts alone, it won't be enough because we know that there are the uh, consumers of forest risk commodities in that case. Um, I, I think there was one interesting study which was published recently from the Research Institute um, of humanity and nature, where they were um, also really putting it down on the tree, um, how many trees is there per consumer um, destroyed, and there you can see the big responsibility we have as a European Union on that, and also I really think um, it's the question of mobilizing change, um, because I, I think that also the, 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 the aim to fight the climate crisis is something that is a glue for multilateralism um, in, in these days. So I think um, if the European Union steps up on that, there will, be, um, there will be governments that will follow. So I think it's a very important thing to do. Um, and it's gonna be important to also set a framework that really is ambitious uh, on that point. So um, this, is, this is very much crucial. And uh, the second second point, and I also see the worrying on the uh, in in the chat, um, which I wanted to comment on, is um, the the question on why is it only the responsibility of the 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 companies? Is there not also um, the cons consumer who is responsible? Um, there is a market demand. There is not enough market demand. I hear that a lot from industries who are critical about the approach we took in the in the parliament. Uh, well. Um, the, the market, of course, um, is not as big for sustainable goods if we don't make it um, more, more binding, I, I would say. And um, I think also in the question, especially when it comes, I think deforestation is, is much more, um, a lot of consumers have a vivid 
image from that. And we actually know that if we decide for or against the product coming from deforestation in the supermarket, it's too late. The tree is always uh, already gone. The human rights have already been harmed. So I think this is a very crucial point when we take our responsibilities as lawmakers seriously to, to stop the climate crisis. We cannot wait until the market mechanism come in place. We have to make the right regulatory framework. So this was basically um, the, the point I wanted to make maybe on a um, super um, official level um, policy-wise because I want that as European Union, we, we strive to, to make a contribution where we say we don't want to make it a, market, a competition advantage to, to not produce sustainable anymore. It's, it's too, we don't have enough time to tackle the climate crisis, so we have to act now. So this is very important. Um, and we do it in partnership. And Lisa also uh, already said with the multi-stakeholder initiative, there's already a lot of initiatives coming from the, from the industries, um, working together in producer countries with different actors. And I think everyone who's really much involved in this needs a concrete framework where we also support actions on the ground. For example, when it comes to the VPAs, and this is what you, you asked me to, to comment on, uh, well, we always look at the timber regulation and, and on the flag agreements and asking ourselves why aren't they coming into place. Uh, I, I think one question is also the, the, the mandatory part and the mandatory binding part of it, because we see, as Lisa described, when we are talking about concrete, le le concrete legislation coming into place, we see that suddenly there are more high level participants coming to our, to our dialogues. I think this is a, a something that will will be different if we, we if we make a good uh, regulation so we need a new kind of uh, next generation vpas uh, where we have this on the ground because this is practically the problem if we want smallholders to still um, have their livelihoods still producing um, the forest risk commodities but in a sustainable way uh, we we have to to look um, very closely to also cooperate because we don't want to take um, also the livelihoods from vulnerable people. So I think it's it's work, working together um, and um, this um, this may be on the on the point. So I think there would will be a change if we have a, a concrete legislation coming up. Thank you very much. That's that's very helpful. And uh, I know Delara, you will also be familiar with the study by uh, over divestment cycle, which has shown the catalyst effect that the flag regime has had in other countries. So there is some good supporting evidence coming out. Ariane, a quick last minute for you before I take the questions. Absolutely, thanks. Uh, I mean, I firstly completely agree uh, with Delara's point on on the role of consumers and the role of the and the role of the state um, and making sure that we don't get get distracted um, by thinking that we, we need this groundswell to come from consumers in order for, for states to act on this. Um, and, and of course, I, I strongly agree with everything else she said, but, but really just to underline that, that point. Um, in, terms of, in terms of looking forward, and I think, and, and just you know, to briefly conclude, I think that we are all certainly um, Certainly, you know, at Global Witness, but but um, within civil society and so on, we are really looking forward to hopefully seeing quite ambitious proposals coming forward in both of these on both of these files from the Commission. And we know that in either case, it's not going to be a silver bullet. I think part of the discussion that's come through today very strongly has shown that we are going to need. Um, we're going to need a, a quite dynamic and, and, and well thought out and in some ways nuanced approach to these issues, which, which, are, which are themselves not straightforward. But I think that the other thing is that a lot is at stake. And so that should focus us and motivate us. And I, and I think that, that these efforts in terms, of, in terms of the EU's efforts to legislate on these issues, hopefully, I really hope, will be, will be worth it. Um, so... Yeah, thanks also to, uh, from me to, to Claire and, and the organizers and, and Joanne, of course, and everyone um, for, for really a fantastic discussion. That's great. Thank you so much, Ariane. Um, so I see in the chat that um, 
the Nova School of Law, which is our host, has asked um, us to turn cameras on for the last part of the Q&A and we'll have the gallery viewed. Now, Claire, I assume we're asking our audience members to turn the their cameras on at this point. So, so that's for the panelists so that we can have the, the view of all, the whole panel for the Q&A for the audience. I see. I see. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to um, go through the Q&A. We have not a huge number of questions, so we have time for them them all. I'm going to take them in reverse order because that's how they're appearing on my screen. So I'm going to start with a question which has been posed by uh, Condice, uh, who asks: the focus on mandatory due diligence seems to be either of a general nature or issue based, and we've seen that today. Is there any reason for this? And could there be a benefit to making the mandatory due diligence resource based? For example, there is a fresh water crisis globally, which corporations contribute to, which does not appear to feature in any of these mandatory due diligence instruments. So what about a, a, a sort of sectoral due diligence instrument that is resource based as opposed to um, either generic or based, I suppose deforestation could be seen as resource based also. Um, so who would like, I think maybe we'll start with Delara there if she's happy to intervene on that question. Yes, I, I'm actually also um, uh, thinking about it. So um, maybe I didn't make that clear enough in the beginning, what we are doing with the um, proposal we have in the, in the parliament on deforestation. It's, it's kind of resource based. It's a sectoral approach because we look at different forest commodities which have a high risk um, of um, contribute to deforestation and, um, and human rights violations. So, um, so this would be the approach we are doing for a high risk sector like, um, like for example, cocoa, palm oil, soy, um, uh, Tire uh, rubber, rubber, sorry, um, and um, I'm I'm not I don't want to miss some, but you you get an impression. So we, we think about the commodities and not not um, about the problem deforestation. So this is basically the answer to the question, and I didn't put it um, clear enough in the beginning. So the deforestation proposal we have in the parliament it, it's a sectoral approach, and the the Yuri and the Voltes report it's a it's a horizontal approach. Great, thanks. So there is some very interesting work coming out now looking at the EU's freshwater footprint globally as a result of the importation and consumption of the kind of forest risk commodities that we're talking about. So I think there is a very clear freshwater dimension to the deforestation due diligence proposal, though not explicitly so. So thank you for that. And then, and then Gabriella has presented uh, two questions and I'll, I'll ask different people to reply to them. The second part of her question first, how do you ensure remediation for human rights abuses resulting for deforestation? Is legal action by those affected before the EU courts the only path envisaged? Um, so uh, I wonder whether Ivano, you would like to say something uh, quite briefly in relation to the question of whether it's the EU courts specifically that are the focus of legal remedies in relation to um, remedying abuses of human rights. Yes, in this moment for uh, for what is, uh, I mean, for the EU courts in this moment, we are still uh, in uh, an impasse. Uh, I mean, it's quite interesting. It's a very, very interesting question, uh, but I think that it is something that we are still uh, trying to figure out. I mean, the problem are uh, in the EU uh, before, for example, the EU courts is a problem of standing. So. Uh, the problem with the remediation is something that uh, we are going to see in the next years if we can, uh, if, if can reach uh, to have uh, a proper kind of litigation on this, uh, on this, uh, of this kind of, um, of issues. So, uh, unfortunately, right. I cannot say much more. No, that's a, a rather depressing answer in relation to the question of standing before the European courts. And Gabriela Gabriel asked two other questions. Um, Will companies dealing with forest risk commodities be carved out of the horizontal or generic human rights due diligence law? I'm going to be brave enough to answer that one myself, but Delara will correct me if I'm wrong. The answer to that is a simple no, I think. There will be no carve out for companies who are trading in forest risk commodities. They will also be subject to due diligence under the more generic proposal. But am I correct, Delara? Correct me if I'm wrong. 
Uh, well, actually, this is the, the 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 hot discussion we are having right now, also with the commission, because um, it depends on how the due diligence systems are, are um, worked out in the different approaches. If there is no um, human, um, the commission, for example, um, might um, not include human rights in in the in the deforestation approach. So we um, we. Of course, then uh, have to discuss that. Um, so this will be the the the, the core region. What will be, um, what would what will be covered by the horizontal approach and what will be covered by the sectoral approach? So um, I cannot give a definite answer okay. on that because the Commission is also elaborating on that. So, um, but this is a good question. This is what we, uh, we, we as part. If it goes from what we have um, said. Um, is that um, of course the the one the companies dealing with FRCs are having um, having more more strict um, due diligence they have to fulfill, um, so that they are carved out of the horizontal approach with that. So this would be what we what what we developed on a on a how you say chessboard, uh, but how it will come together. This is the discussion we are having right now. And I mean, the sort of key takeaway there is perhaps there is a real danger that the human rights dimension of the deforestation proposal will disappear and human rights will be the focus of the, it will be focused on in the more generic proposal, which other people probably have something to say about. So that's very interesting and very important. So, and then the last part of Gabriella's um, tripartite question is, um, how will smallholders be supported to comply with the uh, forest risk commodity law so as to not lose access to the EU market? Will EU importers, for example, be required to support them with capacity building and funding? And again, I think this may be a question for Delara and Ariane may also have something to say about it, also Lisa perhaps. So let's start with Delara and then ask if Lisa or Ariane have something to add. I, I said that um, I think this is a perfect question for the smart mix approach, um, because we know there won't be one legislation that will come up and solve everything with that. So I think what is especially crucial, and I already mentioned this when I was um, talking at the end, um, that's especially important, I think, for small holders is that we, we have those VPAs where, where we have partnership agreements that um, that support um, farm, uh, small holders to, to um, comply to sustainable practices. So I think this is um, this is very important. We um, I, I don't know if um, if it's wishful um, it is something that you have to ask companies uh, to do so in this framework uh, because I think it comes with the with the uh, with the partnership that that you 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 need capacity building and this is basically also what we we hear a lot from industry that um, that. Governance capacity building is needed. Technical assistance when it comes, for example, the the capability of smallholders to to produce sustainable FRCs. Um, that it's a question of technical um, so solutions we we need. So um, I think it's crucial that we have those instruments that we that we support in governance uh, capacity building and technical capacity building, but also having with the VPAs with the multi stakeholder. Um, Initiatives we have um, fora where all um, where all actors on the supply chain will come together and elaborate on this problem. So um, I don't think that it's something that you can design perfectly for every industry, but so something that has to be worked on together. And this is why I think the partnership agreements and the multi-stakeholder initiatives are crucial points. Certific existing certification schemes are important tools to to help manage manage the uh, responsibilities that come with due diligence requirements. So um, I think this all will support also smallholders in, in producing sustainable FRCs. So, so Lisa, would you like to add anything to um, Delara's answer? Yes. Um, yeah, we just had a discussion yesterday in our multi-stakeholder forum on palm oil, and they told me that there are already big companies who clean up their value chain and removing the smallholders from the palm oil um, purchasing. And so the NGOs are criticizing this, but somehow there, of course, there is this paradox. And um, yeah, this makes me, leads me a bit to thinking, of course, we have multiple approaches and we have the certification systems and um, it's it, it will be something we really have to look in because with the VPAs, we only have one VPA working with Indonesia, but I think, a, a broader agreement like a VPA 
uh, is then needed um, uh, and, uh, and somehow maybe um, to really enforce the idea of remedy and um, and uh, responsibility with due diligence and not only make a, a system transparent um, and, and really combine human rights and the deforestation agenda so to the benefit of the people and um, yeah it, it will become I, I think it will get in a way difficult because we we're very committed to development cooperation but sometimes it's it's more that we act um, that we have islands and pilot projects where we can show how it works but this regulation will really, really affect whole industries and um yeah to really help then every smallholder affected there will be a, a major task so um i think we are very very committed and and i i think yeah our partner countries um uh, need to articulate as well their needs and um uh how to uh mitigate and and prevent this development so um yeah it's it's becoming very concrete already now so i've realized i've been a very bad chair and i've let time run away from us in fact my clock on my computer is a couple of minutes slow which i forgot about um so i'm going to um suggest that we stop and that the question about see the relationship between csr and company profit maybe ariane could write something in the chat about how she sees that and in relation to the question of whether mandatory uh, due diligence may be a shield to accountability rather than a facilitator of accountability, maybe Syria uh, and Ivano would like to write something in relation to that. And I apologize that I let time run away. We were having such an interesting conversation that I lost track for a moment, but I, I'm under very strict instructions that we must finish by uh, five o'clock Florence time, it's now one minute two. So I'm going to pass over to Claire and, and say simply, thank you very much for a really fascinating discussion. I've learned, I've learned a lot. Claire, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joan, and, uh, and a very warm thank you to, to uh, the wonderful panelists for an extremely insightful discussion. Uh, thank you also to all our partners. Thank you to uh, Laura Inigo Alvarez for helping uh, to host this event and for the members of the NOVA Center on Business, the Human Rights and the Environment. Thank you, of course, to, to the audience. And uh, I would like to invite you to uh, our, uh, the next episode of our webinar series, which will focus on corporate due diligence and sustainable finance. And that will be on the 27th of May at the same time. Um, so, um, just to, to conclude again, a warm thank you to all of you, and uh, I hope to see you again all very soon. Bye bye. 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 Bye bye. Thank